Caleb's going to come and read our scripture for the day. I know I just told you to sit down, but I ask you to stand back up as we read. Uh, the Bible passage is from Romans chapter 7 today. Awesome, you can throw that up if you don't have a Bible. There's a pew Bible in front of you, page number on the screen. And um, so I'll give you a chance to get there. So this is what we're going to be jumping into in a few minutes after we sing a little bit more and pray together. And uh, Caleb, if you will read, we'll start reading at verse number 1. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might live for God. When we were in the realm of flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us, so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what now, to what once bound us, we have been released from the law, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment to seize me, and through the commandment put me to death. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Ooh. That was a mouthful, Caleb. That was awesome. Um, oh boy, we're talking about the law today. And this is the word of God for the people of God, and he said, you may be seated. Let's read and sing together. All right, so let's jump into the Bible, uh, Romans chapter 7 today. And um, I, I tried to get away from the whiteboard. We're going to sort of do communion here in a little bit, so my wife might be over there a little bit longer than she wants to be. But um, I couldn't get away from the whiteboard today because I think it's just going to help us understand. And if you're on the side, it'll be on the screen, hopefully, in front of you. And so let's section off our board here, and then we'll kind of try to fill it in a little bit and see what God might want to say to us. Now, we talked about a couple of weeks ago that what Paul is doing is he's kind of reliving the journey of the people of God. And so in Romans 6, we get this understanding of baptism. And so uh, the parting of the Red Sea, you'll remember, they walk through on dry ground. When you pass through the waters, this dying to self, this dying to the old life, passing through the waters of baptism, death and resurrection, so that we can be uh, more understanding and, and, and start this journey of saint justification and sanctification and what that looks like. Uh, Romans 7, which we're going to start today for the next two weeks, is, uh, is, is, is this understanding of when the people got through the waters, they went to this place called Sinai, Mount Sinai, where God gave them the law. God gave them the, the law that he, uh, uh, what it meant to be the people of God. And so this is kind of law and Mount Sinai journey. And then uh, we're going to go in Romans 8. Oh, man, wait till you hear this. The whole six Sundays of Lent, we're going to snail-like crawl through. But uh, Romans 8 is this understanding of what God's going to do with creation and it's understanding what that looks like. And so this is kind of like the promised land. The people arrive at the promised land, the end of the journey, and because it talks a lot about the, the, with the creation and what's happening in creation and what this whole thing looks like. And today we talk about the law. The law, um, the law or this written code or whatever word you want to write for it is mentioned in every verse that Caleb read for us this morning. In fact, you go through 14, verse 14, where it's mentioned in every verse. And it's actually mentioned some 35 times in chapter 7 alone. So here's what we got to do. A lot of quotes, a lot of Bible today, so I hope you're ready. Um, John Stott, uh, this quote won't be on the screen, but I just wanted, I wanted, I wanted to lay the groundwork for what this looks like. He says this, once again, not on the screen, just listen. It is never wise to bring to a passage of Scripture our own ready-made agenda, insisting that it answers our questions 
and addresses our concerns. For what is to dictate to Scripture, for that is to dictate to Scripture instead of listening to them. We have to lay aside our presuppositions so that we can consist, conscientiously think ourselves back into the historical and cultural setting of the text. Then we shall be in position to let the author say what he does say and not force him to say what we want him to say. This is one of the most highly contested chapters in the whole Bible. And we have to hear what Paul is really actually saying rather than what we want him to potentially say. Which begs the question, which begs the question, are we still obligated to the law or not? Are we still obligated to the law or not? Do we still have to follow it or not? You ready for this? No, I don't think you are. Are you ready for this? Psalm 19. Let's see what the Jewish people think of the law. Psalm chapter 19. Let's see what the Jews, oh man, this is, this kind of opened my eyes. This whole week kind of opened my eyes. Psalm 19, verse number 7. Oh, listen to this. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statues of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure, and all of them are righteous. And then listen to verse 10. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey, than honeycomb. The law of the Lord is perfect. Luke, Luke chapter 16. This is Jesus' own words. And uh, this is uh, maybe kind of surprising, but it's Jesus' own words here. Jesus is telling a parable about a rich man and a man named Lazarus. And the rich man goes to hell and Lazarus goes to heaven. And, and, and the rich man and Abraham are having this conversation. And um, he's like, hey, if you could just dip some water and touch my tongue. And, um, and, 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 and goes on and on and on. And then he says this, verse 27. Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Listen to this. This is so good. Abraham replied, they have Moses, which when Hebrews talked about Moses, they were talking about the law, and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone Go let them look at the law and the prophets. Everything they need is right there. Matthew chapter 5. Verse number 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So this law thing, we, 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 it's just this understanding of like, yeah, but it's just the law. And Jesus is like, no, it's the law. It, it's perfect. Like, like, that's how they viewed it and what it is. Now, this may be shocking to you, but, um, but, but, but back in Jesus' time, uh, people viewed the law differently. And I'm sure that's just so shocking that people would read something and think something very different than somebody else, right? But we're, we're and it happens today, too. Timothy Keller talks about this specific group called the Pharisees which Paul was until he had his Damascus Road experience. And he says this, next slide. This is not surprising because Paul had been a Pharisee and the Pharisees thought of sin not only, only in terms, this is huge, of external actions. They felt as long as you didn't perform an evil act, you were not guilty of sin. This made it easier to think of yourself as an obedient, law-abiding person. 
So a Pharisee would look at the law and say, man, it's all just about what you do and how you act. And if you act right and you, you, you just do what you're supposed to do, blah, 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 then everything will be okay. Um, kind of reminds me of, uh, man, I believe in something. Oh, that's right. We thought if we dressed right, if we didn't go to places, we'd be good. Don't smoke, drink, touch, and chew where gay girls will be. Newsflash, you could do that and still be in trouble. An atheist can do that. An atheist cannot go to certain places. An atheist can do certain things. An atheist, and the Pharisees thought the same thing. If I just do, if I just continue to do, 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 do exactly what the law says, then I'm going to be okay. Maybe not. That group is called the legalists. Next slide. Legalists are under the law and in bondage to it. They are under the law, and it's just it's this this sin, it's this prison, it's this bondage, it's this understanding of I'm just so trapped because I just got to do, do, do. And as long as I do, 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 and do all the things I'm supposed to do and, and, and be a part of that, then it's going to be good. Uh, and guess what? There's an opposite to that. Hold on. I'm not going to spell this right. Let me get my eyes out here. It, they are the antinomians. You know what they think? Next slide. The opposite extreme. You know what? It's just about love. Let's, the, the, the law just causes problems. They reject it all together and claim that they rid all obligation to anything that the law says. So you got the legalist. It's all about the law. If I just do everything the law says, then I'm going to be okay. You got the antinomians. Forget the law. Anytime we come across scripture, what we have to do is we have to say when there's a negative statement. So Paul says um, the law and, and starts talking about it. And sometimes he uses this negative language about the law. But what we have to understand when there's a negative understanding of scripture, we have to see what the counterpart is. What is he speaking against rather than just assuming what we understand what he's speaking against. And so when Paul talks negative about the law, what is he actually speaking against in the law? That's a great question. And he uses it to many different levels, many different understandings. Uh, but here's the thing. So uh, we talked about in chapter 6, this understanding that the law cannot bring about justification. The law serves a purpose, and we're going to get into more of that in just a little bit. But the law cannot save me. Only God can save me. The law cannot do that work which I need to be done in my heart because only Jesus' blood through the forgiveness of what he's called me to do in order to can do that. And so when Paul talks about negative, so what he's talking about negative is this understanding of justification. That the law cannot justify us. And so when, when we talk negative, it's this understanding that the law cannot do that thing. Now in Galatians, and we talked about at the end of, of Romans chapter 6, Paul jumps into this, this next part of, of the spiritual life in sanctification. And when he talks negative about the law, it's this understanding that only life in the Spirit, only being in step with the Spirit is what sanctifies me, not the law. And so when we take the law as this negative thing that we don't have to, to live to it anymore, we're missing the point of what Paul's trying to make. It's not that the law is bad, let's throw it away. It's that if you're hoping the law is going to save you, if you're hoping the law is going to sanctify you, then it doesn't mean we just throw it away. You know that? It doesn't mean we just can't do it. When we're talking about justification, the law can't do it. When we're talking about sanctification, the law can't do it. But the law still has a purpose. On the next slide, John Stott says this. So for justification, we are not under the law, but we're under grace. And for sanctification, we're not under the law, but we are led by the Spirit. The law cannot do those things. And so when Paul speaks negative about the law, he's saying it's because it can't accomplish this. Paul talks about death. Um, and he talks about marriage and, and talks about this understanding that if a, a, a woman and a husband, and the husband is still alive, that the woman is still obligated to her husband no matter what. Till death do us part. Doesn't mean much these days, but it did back then. Till 
death do us part. And so if she were to go out and, 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 and have relations with another man, then she would be committing a sin against not just God, but against this person. But if he dies, she's no longer in the man. If he dies and she gets married again, then, then it's, it's, it's okay because he's, she's not under this law because he's not, I heard Paul say it. longer live under the understanding that we have to follow every single don't worry I'm going to get there don't go where I'm not going just yet but we, we no longer live that the law is going to save you I'm no longer in prisoner to following the law because if I don't I'm going to burn I no longer live with the understanding that if I don't cross every and, and, and I don't live with this guilt this understanding so I die to myself I die to that understanding of what Jesus has done for me so that I can then be in there with the man that Jesus is in there. Now, before you think I'm getting crazy, let's uh, let's jump into this. Uh, so it says, like Paul, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live, but now it's Christ that's living in me. In this life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's in the law. Why are we doing it? Why are we doing it? My homeboy, John Wesley, why are we saying that? Why are we saying that? Um, Law tears away sin's disguises and shows it for what it really is. Law tears away sin's disguises and shows it for what it really is. So I wouldn't know this is a sin unless you told me it couldn't be, right? I would think it'd just be all right. So the law guides us and shows us what sin really is and puts away the mask of what it is. Dr. Greathouse says this, the law's problem, though, is its weakness. It was never intended to be the means of salvation. On the contrary, the law is God's instrument of convincing the fallen world of its sinfulness and need of a Savior. It's to show you, like, you can't do this on your own. I don't care how good you can be. You can't make yourself holy. You can't make yourself safe. You need a Savior to do that. stuck that this does not mean that we have been divorced from it altogether in the sense that it has no more claims on us of any kind or that we have no more obligations to it. Now, when I read this passage, and hopefully when you do, you start to ask questions because I'm always asking questions and all these things try to jump out at me. So when I read this passage, Paul talks about a specific law, coveting. Of the Ten Commandments, Paul could have talked about any of them, but he talks about the last one, coveting. Now, if you're, if you're me, I'm like, why in the world are we talking about that one? You know, like, what is it about coveting that would cause Paul to say, this is the one I'm going to really harp on right here and right now? And if you ask that question, it's a great question, I would say, because it was mine. Most of the Ten Commandments are about outward behavior. go throughout most, I've gone my whole life without killing anybody. <laughs> let me, let me uh, bring that up to date a little bit here. Before the bathroom models are done, I'm not sure, but as of right now, we are all good. We're all good. But coveting, hmm. I could go my whole life and you would never know if I covet. Can only read, to be better fact, you can only read the Ten Commandments like that until you reach the tenth. The last commandment is the one that cannot be reduced to an external. It has everything to do with inward attitude and outward behavior. I mean, it's almost like Jesus said something to us. I don't know, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But you've heard it said. heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I tell you, don't even lust. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
you've heard it said, you've heard it said, you've heard it said. And it's almost like Jesus saying, you can do a lot of this stuff, but it's not just about what you do. It's about who you are. And the teller goes on to say, Jesus showed that all the Ten Commandments referred only to behavior, but the inward attitude is the main thing. Yeah, so we're going to skip in this. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel chapter 36. So what do we do with this? How do we live? What do we, what do we understand about what Jesus is trying to tell us to do and who he's trying to tell us to be? promise we're getting to the end of this and we're hopefully wrap it all up and then we're going to do some communion together here in a few minutes too. Ezekiel chapter 36. Oh man. So if it's not just about what I do outward, but there's got to be something going on inward that causes me to act differently outward. Uh, verse Ezekiel uh, verse uh, chapter 36 verse 24. For I, this is God talking, would take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So we this understanding of what, 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 is, what is going on here. What's the point of the law, and how does it understand about what it, how it works in my life and what it's supposed to be? N.T. Wright says this, The law, in other words, was the channel not only for knowledge about sin, but for knowledge of sin in the sense that as a result of the process, I knew from the inside what sin meant in practice. From the inside, what sin meant in practice. So we return to the question, whether the law is still binding on Christians or whether we can just expect that, do we still have to obey it? We come to that question once more. Do I still have to look at the law as part of my life and what it was intended to be? And John Stott says this, long quote on the screen, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that Christian freedom, this is so, oh my, Christian freedom is freedom to serve, not freedom we are still slaves, slaves of God and of righteousness. But also know, because the motives and means of our service have completely changed. Why do we serve? Not because the law is our master and we have to, but because Christ is our husband and we want to. Not because obedience leads to salvation, but because salvation leads to obedience. Woo! Do I still serve the Lord? Yeah, but not because I have to. Because God has done something on the inside that I need to be obedient. Obedience or, or, it doesn't lead to obedience, but, but but salvation leads to obedience to doing everything that God has called me to do and to be. So what's the third one? We're not legalists. We're not antimonimians. this? I'm going to get this right. We are law fulfilling free people. <laughs> right? That's what we are. Do I fulfill the law? Yeah, but not because I am like think that it's going to save me or sanctify me. I do it because I have been saved and sanctified, and therefore I want to be everything that God's called me to be. Oh, that's good. That is good. So we preserve the balance. They rejoice both, both, and they rejoice both in their freedom and for the law, because we are being led to Christ and being like Scripture in Matthew 22. number 34, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, teacher, which law is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is just like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All! You notice how long I went? Because I want to make sure we understood it was all. The law and the prophets hang on these two commandments 
So what was the law? What was the intent of the law? What was God trying to help us understand? He was trying to help us understand that if you hate your brother, that's not a good thing. He was trying to help us understand that we got to love the Lord God with everything, our heart, soul, mind, body, strength, everything that we are so that we can be who he's called us to be. And so how are we law-fulfilling, free people? We love God and we love others. And they ask Jesus, who's my neighbor? And Jesus says, are they breathing? Do they walk? Do they, 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 they still, if you put a glass and a mirror in front of their face, will they fog up? It's your neighbor. And you're not just in our country. First John says this, how can you you love somebody you haven't seen when you hate somebody that you do know? That's the whole commandment. The whole law is to get us to the understanding and push us to the point that, that the whole law summed up as love God and love others with your heart, soul, mind, strength, everything that you are. Love God and love others with everything that you are. That's what it's pushing us to. You took it to mean if I just follow every rule, then I'm good. And God's like, no, because there's this part on the inside that, that you could have hate and anger and bitterness and, 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 and pride. And you've got to get rid of that. And then you will act differently because God has done something on the inside. The law can't do it. Only his love and his spirit and his power can justify you and sanctify you. But when he does that, you're going to be a different person. And you're going to do what he's called you to do. And you're going to live like he's called you to live. Because the whole law has pointed to Jesus said, you missed it. You thought it was about doing things. I guess it was. It was about loving God. You know what's funny about the Apostle Paul? It's so rich. I love the Bible. You know, it's just it's so rich. Philippians 3. You want to brag about how awesome of a Jew you were? I was better. I was following him. And you know what? I, Paul never came under um, conviction. He never sat down and wondered and thought, man, am I doing what God wants me to do? He believed with everything that he was that he was doing everything that God wanted him to do. Get rid of all these Christians. They don't know what they're talking about. And so he never had this guilt. I mean, he was passionate. He was zealous. He was, he was on fire for God, for Yahweh. I mean, he was. And so what changed? Um, Jesus spoke to him. about is, is Paul, can he, can he do this? And what Paul did, this is a great lesson in prayer, man. This is, this is great life. He responded. I think I put response in quotes, man. But what grace is, is this responsible living, but it's a response to God's love. It so transforms us. Law is not the enemy. Sin is the enemy. The law all along was meant to push us to be more like God and His image and His love. And if we could get people to respond to that love. Um, after 9-11, churches were full. And people were afraid. And then when they weren't afraid anymore, churches weren't full anymore. respond to, man, I just want to be who you call me to be. All fulfilling free people. And the greatest point we see is that all fulfilling free people is Jesus. I can't think of a better way to 
me this morning to understand what that looks like. And to come to the meal where Jesus says, the wounds are broken and torn. And I say, oh, Lord. You come and you eat the bread and you, you partake in the juice of the broken body and poor blood of Jesus. It refocuses my mind that, yes, I do live into what the law is calling me to be about. It's not because I have to, but because love has so made a difference in my life and has transformed me in this way. And now I want to I want to love God with everything I am. I want to help everybody I come in contact with. I want to be a part of anybody's life that will allow me to speak into their life and be a part 